HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. With over 30 years in business and a satisfaction guarantee, you can trust Psychic Source. Receive private readings over the phone or chat. Call 800 551 3400 for prices as low as 83 cents per minute. Use promo code PHONE to save. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth with your host, Diane Helbig. Diane is a leading small business development and leadership coach, author, and speaker who is passionate about sharing valuable ideas, tips, and techniques with business professionals worldwide. Diane brings you the world's experts and gurus in all things business, whether it's sales, structure, social media, planning, or plateauing, guests bring their expertise and energy to each episode. When growing your business is your focus, Accelerate Your Business Growth is the show to listen to. Got a topic or guest suggestion? Let Diane know. The goal is to make sure you have the information you need to move your business forward. Thanks for joining us. Settle in and enjoy. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Today's podcast is sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken audio entertainment and information. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. Get a free book when you sign up for a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash business growth. This podcast has uh, continues to gain recognition as a go-to uh, resource for small business owners and entrepreneurs and sales professionals. From MSNBC's Your Business to Inc.com to Fit Small Business, uh, Proven.com, a whole bunch of uh, other lists. Uh, People are saying, you know, this is the place that entrepreneurs need to go to get the information that they need to be able to grow their businesses better. And it's really um, in large part because of the guests that come on here. They give of their time and their expertise to share with all of you so that you can learn things um, and implement them as soon as you've heard them. And you can always go back and listen again. So we are pretty excited about that. And we have one of those guests today. My guest is Richard Chapo. Richard is a lawyer in San Diego who advises online businesses on topics ranging from copyright to privacy law and other subjects every online business owner should know. He's been practicing for 25 years and believes in practicing preventative or preventive, not sure how I say that, law designed to limit the legal risks his clients face. Richard is also an avid traveler and hockey fan. Thank you so much for joining me today, Richard. Well, thank you for having me on. I'm pretty excited about this because we haven't talked about it. And I believe that just about every business out there should consider themselves an online business. If they are engaging in any way online, they should consider themselves an online business. Would you agree with that or disagree? 
No, I definitely would agree. The uh, yeah, the online industry faces a couple different little issues um, than those entities that are just retail that are offline, brick and mortar. Um, so it is important to have an understanding kind of what you're facing when you are online uh, and how to address certain issues. So, for instance, a lot of businesses in the offline world, you know, copyright's much less of an issue than it is uh, for businesses online because uh, it's simple for people to copy and repost things. So uh, it's definitely important to have at least an idea of what you're doing online. Okay, so so let's talk about copyright. Can you explain to my listeners um, what copyright infringement actually is? Sure. Uh, well, let's start with what copyright is. Copyright is essentially a right that automatically applies to a work um, that you create, that somebody has created. So the example I like to use is Stephen King, the well-known author. When he writes a book, he finishes that book, he's automatically vested with what's called a common law copyright in it. And that means that he has the right to use, perform, uh, copy, obviously, and resell that book. And so what actually happens in that industry is he'll sign a contract with a publisher uh, and the publisher pays him an advance and a, a royalty uh, for the right to resell that that work to the public. So that's the general idea of copyright. Now, obviously, it, it applies to photos and other things as well. But that gives you kind of the idea. Uh, copyright infringement is simply the unauthorized use of that copyright. So if I was to go out and copy his latest novel and start selling it on Amazon, I'm committing copyright infringement. Um, what you see more with businesses, obviously, is something a little less obvious, and that's um, you know you may hire a web designer who uses an image um, when they give you the website. You know, it has an image or something of that sort, and there, there's no right to use that image. They haven't haven't received a copyright license, or there's no fair use defense to the use of that image, and so they can run into copyright infringement problems. I I hear that one happens a lot. That people it does. use images, right? They say, I'm going to Google and find an image. It's okay, but you can't use it, but they think they can. Absolutely. Yes, there's, um, <laughs> there's a lot of confusion uh, about it. You know, copyright law has been around for hundreds of years. And so when you have any area of law that's that old, it doesn't always translate well to new technological mediums. And the uh, internet's an obvious example. Um, but yes, really, you have to ask yourself, you know, before you take something that you find online and you republish it somewhere, you know, how, how do you have permission to do that? Or is there a defense for doing that? In most cases, the answer is no. And you're exactly right. People go onto Google and they'll search, uh, or maybe they'll see something funny and they'll post it to their Facebook page. Um, you know, a whole variety of different things. And it's important to make sure that, you know, when you do that, that you think about, whoa, do I have permission to do this or not? Um, damages in a copyright infringement case can be as low as $200 per violation if you're an innocent infringer, but they can also be as high as $150,000. Um, wow. So, yeah, so we're talking about, you know, significant risk. Uh, in addition to that, attorney's fees can be awarded against you and what have you. Um, but copyright infringement is probably um, the most common legal claim we see in the Internet environment. Uh, it's just so easy for people to, you know, right click, save and then republish something um, that, you know, a lot of people do it innocently. Uh, but it does occur. And so it's important as a business that you don't infringe on somebody else. But it's also important that you recognize that you have copyrights, you know, in the content that you have on, on your site, yeah. on your app, and that you move to protect those because people will be copying them. So how do you move to protect them? Well, the best approach is you use, you can use sites like Copyscape. Um, there's services that will go out and hunt around to see if people have taken and stolen your content. And I can tell you the answer is yes, they will have. It's, it's very common. Um, unfortunately, you know, there are bots that go out that will just scrape sites. It's called scraping, and they'll just take the content off of a site and republish it somewhere else, um, you know, for the purpose of trying to generate sales through email spam or, you know, a whole variety of different little black hat ideas. Um, so it is going to happen. So you want to use sites like Copyscape or you want to just go out and do searches for your business name, um, for the name of your products, your services. Um, you can just do Google searches and you'll just see, you know, people that have just blatantly ripped you off. Uh, and at that point, you're going to file what's called a DMCA takedown request is usually the simplest approach. Uh, and you'll file it with the host for that site uh, and the host will take it down. You can also go to uh, Google, Yahoo um, and Bing and submit uh, complaints to them and they'll take them out of the search results. It just kind of depends on, you know, the specific strategy that you want to use. In a worst case scenario, you can also go ahead and look at, you know, just suing them for copyright infringement. Um, yeah, and, and take things down from that perspective. 
Is the, is the same true if you have a trademark and you see, like, so, for example, I have a trademark on um, my networking groups, and I just, someone just told me that someone else is using it on a meetup. So is the same, I mean, I just emailed her and said, you know, I'm sure you don't know, but, you know, this is the deal, and could you stop using it immediately? Uh, but is, does the same rule apply? Uh, it's slightly different, but yes, yeah, so the same general concept. Somebody's using your mark without, um, you know, your consent, then certainly there's a potential issue there. The issue with trademarks is whether the use of that mark would cause confusion with consumers. Uh, trademarks are very market-oriented. Um, so if you look at Google, for instance, you know, people throw the, around the name Google all the time in articles and, and what have you, and you'll see domains, uh, things of that sort. And, you know, the question is, does that dilute, um, you know, the value of Google's mark in the sense that consumers wouldn't recognize uh, or would think that these other companies are actually a part of Google. And most people understand that they're not. So in that case, you know, Google would have some problems enforcing that. Certainly there are a lot of cases where they'd be successful. Um, so you do have to kind of look at it from that perspective. But yeah, it's the same, same general idea. One thing you did say, though, that brings up a very important point is actually look at the infringement and think about it. In a lot of cases, like you just mentioned, the person who may be infringing on you may not realize uh, right. that, that they're causing a problem just because they're not familiar with copyright or trademark laws. And in that situation, when you contact them, you know, if you have a business where you're selling something and let's say you have an affiliate program, you may contact them and say, Hey, you know, you're, you're infringing on our copyright. However, if you were to go ahead and join our affiliate program and, you know, add links to this, you know, this article that you've copied, you know, we wouldn't have a problem with it or something like that. So you could turn it into a business opportunity to some extent, you know, people almost initially in these infringement cases always kind of fly off the hook, you know, cause they're offended yeah. that somebody stole their content. <laughs> but in some cases it's innocent. I represent some bands and the bands are always outraged that their music has been taken, you know, and they'll see it up on YouTube. And sometimes you look at the, the videos and the person who's posted is a fan, you know, and the yeah. fan is, is yeah. it's, they're promoting them. So do we really right. want to write a letter that says, you know, burn in hell? Probably not. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's a little, so. a little <laughs> counterproductive, a little you know, so if you, if you get, get kind of, you know, really think it through and be a little more friendly with the, uh, you know, the, the person who maybe is infringing, but isn't doing it maliciously. Now there are groups out there, it'd be absolutely clear. There are groups out there that maliciously do it. Uh, they call black hatters and they typically move all their stuff offshore. So it's, it's difficult to go after them. Uh, and they are trying to rip you off and make um, money. If you have a lot of clients that do courses, uh, and they sell courses online, and it's just a never-ending battle um, because people will copy those courses and promote them online. Um, so uh, there are situations, but the key is, you know, look at it and, and try and have, you know, right. practical common sense approach to it. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for saying that because I agree. People get really uh, up in arms, but the, the best course is in, in those is to stop and think, right, and, and just be really reasonable. So. Yeah, I think absolutely, particularly, you know, just even if you take 24 hours to let it settle. I mean, I've had, I get calls on strange things, as do all internet attorneys, you know, people furious their name was used on another site, and you look at it, and you realize, well, your name is Bob Smith, and, you know, they're not actually referring to you, <laughs> and, you know, it's not a lot we can do here, <laughs> you know, it's, so sometimes, you know, sometimes yeah. people get a little fired up. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. Um so, but, but along these same lines, what is fair use defense? Right, the much discussed fair use defense. So if you go on YouTube, you'll see somebody play, oh, let's say they copy an album that you, you, you enjoy and you'll see them put in the description, this is not my content, this is a fair use defense, you know, fair use defense of a copyright infringement claim. I'm just putting it up for fans or something of that sort. Uh, and that's not what a fair use defense is. Most people don't seem to understand what fair use is. And it's understandable because it's a nebulous concept. So fair use is any copying of copyrighted material done for a limited and transformative purpose. So for example, to criticize that, so let's Blade Runner. I'm a big Blade Runner fan. The Blade Runner movie's coming out, the new one. Uh, you're going to see YouTube, article, or YouTube videos, um, posts on sites that are going to review the movie. And particularly on the YouTube videos, you may see small clips from the movie um, where the one they're talking about it. Okay, well, that's, that's not copyright infringement because um, you're not using that work, the original work, 
essentially yeah. to profit from. You're using it to criticize it either positively or negatively. Uh, and so that's an accepted transformative purpose. Uh, so how do you determine what a transformative purpose is? And here's where things get a little ugly. There's a four factor yeah. test. So you look at the purpose and character of your use. So if we go back to the criticism of, of Blade Runner, you know, the purpose there is for criticism. We're not copying the full work for the purpose of reselling it to make money. Uh, the second is the nature of the copyrighted work. So it's an entirely original work. Um, so Harry Potter book written by J.K. Rowling would be an entirely original work. You know, copyright infringement would apply strongly to that versus a book that was a, a list of historical facts or something of that sort. Facts can't be copyrighted oh. because they're, they're general to everybody. Uh, third fact would be, a uh, third factor is the amount and substantiality of the portion taken. So did you take a small portion of Blade Runner in our movie review or did we copy the whole movie and put it up? Um, and then the fourth thing being the effect of the use upon the potential market. So if I take Stephen King's book and I copy it all and I resell it on Amazon for a smaller price, I'm taking money out of his pocket. So that's going to be strongly yeah. against me. The problem that you run into with fair use, there are two. First one to understand is fair use is a defense. And what that means is you don't know if it applies until you're in trial. <laughs> and the other, <laughs> side is, the other side is proven copyright infringement. Now you have to prove a defense. Um, and so the problem is even if you win a fair use defense at that point, uh, you know, you spent many, many, many tens of thousands of dollars, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars right. defending the action. So do you have the money to do that? The second problem is this is an area of law that not only do business owners hate, but lawyers quite honestly are very disappointed in. And it's those four factors, there's no definitive black line on which ones are most important. Um, mm. It's just basically up to a judge or jury, depending on how the, the trial moves forward as to what they think. So if two of the factors are strongly in your favor and two are against, you may get a completely different decision depending on the court you're in. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, you know, there's just no definitive wow. answers. Right. So for instance, uh, I give you a bizarre case. Uh, the Prince baby dancing baby case on uh, YouTube went on for 10 years. And what happened was a woman had a picture or had a small video of her baby and the baby was dancing for about, I don't know, 20 seconds or so. And they, she used a sampling from a Prince song uh, for that 20 seconds. And the question was, well, is that infringement or not? And does fair use apply? And it went, it went 10 years. It went all the way up to the United States Supreme Court, arguing over which factors were most important. Was it? Was it not? Uh, you know, it just turned into this never-ending you know, nightmare, basically. Oh. Um, now, both parties were vested in it. We're trying to make a bigger point. And so, uh, you know, a lot of people funded her defense and what have you. But that's kind of the situation. And that situation, if I had looked at it originally, I probably would have said, it's fair use. It's, you know, it's a small sampling of the song. Obviously, it's intended to, um, you know, deprive Prince's right. music publisher of money, you know, all those kinds of things. But it went on for 10 years. And literally, and even wow. at the, in the end, the decision was kind of muddled. Um, so relying on a fair use defense, unless it's an obvious defense or you have a lawyer who's looked at it and said, yeah, I can defend this, you have to be very, very careful. Uh, one area that causes, there's two other areas that cause confusion with um, the fair use defense. One is you'll see people say it's in the public domain. And what the public domain, that phrase, what it means to you and me maybe as lay people is one thing. What it means in the legal market is something different. So in, in lay sense, we may think, well, it's something people have just kind of put out in the market like open source software that you can use. But in the legal uh, community, what that means is you're looking at a legal th theory that says we don't want to have copyright um, last forever. So instead it lasts, and there are different ways to measure it, but essentially it lasts 70 years from the death of the author. So if Stephen King were to die, copyright would, would you know, this year it would go for another 70 years. And after that, all those things that have been copyrighted under his name, as long as 70 years have passed from his death, would uh, expire. And then people could go out and publish it. So you'll see, if you go to a bookstore, God forbid you ever still go to a bookstore, but um, you'll see Penguin books or some of these older books and they'll have classics from the 1800s. They're not paying royalties on those um, because of those books, the copyright has expired. And so they're republishing those works and that's why you see them listed. And you kind of thinking, you know, why are these here? Um, so it's, you know, it's kind of a lucrative market. So when somebody says public domain, unless the person who created it has died and a substantial amount of time has passed, that's not a public domain defense. Um, the second area is you'll see people link back to the original content uh, and they'll say, well, I'm giving attribution. 
Um, attribution is a defense to a claim of plagiarism, which is not a legal claim. That's just an academic claim. Uh, attribution is not a defense to copyright infringement. Wow. And in fact, it can actually get you in more trouble than not. Um, because if you're linking back and you're sued for copyright infringement, you can no longer claim that you were an innocent infringer because obviously you right. knew there was an issue because you linked back. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you'd have to be very careful with some of these things. Uh, you know, and that's, that's, it's an important issue to look at. So the bigger idea though is fair use. Does it apply? Yes. It applies in parodies, uh, criticism. If you're commenting on something, something that's newsworthy. Um, but if you start pushing into other areas, you need to be very careful um, because you could certainly uh, incite a claim. Yeah, boy. Ugh. Okay. <laughs> There's a lot of people so, that feel that way. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Um, and, and, you know, and I know a lot of people who this is the reason why they either don't want to put their content on the Internet or they don't want to participate at all in any sort of engagement or discussions or anything because they're afraid of all of these things. And, you know, my thing is just be forewarned is forearmed. If you understand to some degree what you can and can't do and air you err on the side of caution, you have to be out there. You, you have to be participating because it's the new marketing landscape. Oh, absolutely. I think there's two, two things to take out of it. Um, the first would be simply that, um, you know, if you're going to proceed, um, you know, putting your own content up there is fine. You're never going to have a problem with your own original content because you're creating it. Um, so that's fine. And then the second thing would be if you're going to look at other people's content and consider putting it into your site or in your social media or whatever, just ask yourself, do I have permission? Uh, and if right. you're not sure or you don't, just ask. And people will yeah. give it. Um, but a lot of time you do have permission. It's important to also state this. You know, 20 years ago, the idea of, you know, putting something out to the public, going out on your street and yelling to the public, you know, I'm eating dinner now and here's what I'm eating would have been ludicrous. <laughs> but we do it now. Social media, you know, social media, people post all kinds of things. And so we have a sharing, yeah. a sharing environment online. And so people will share all that stuff. So if you're on a site and you see a post somewhere and it has a, uh, you know, Facebook or Twitter, like, or Instagram, whatever it is, you know, and it has those buttons, you can go ahead and share because they're giving you permission. That's what that is. Um, so you just need to be a little careful about, you know, making sure that that is there and whoever's posting content to your site, whether it's yourself or if you have employees doing or whatever, you know, are following those kinds of guidelines. So it's not, it's not that negative a situation. Another thing you can do is you can go to Creative Commons. Creative Commons has license uh, that people can use freely with their content. Used to be a great system, still is a great system. I would be a little careful because um, you have to be, you have to worry about the person who's posting those images. So, for instance, if I go to Instagram and I see an image I like and I copy it, and then I go over to Creative Commons and you know I, I post it as or to Flickr, let's say, and I post it and I put a Creative Commons license on there, well, it's still infringement because I stole it from the person on, on Instagram. Yeah, um, so you have right. to be a little careful with those. You can always get free content. Uh, not free, but you can get paid content on the stock photo sites. Um, a lot of them are getting yeah. cheaper because of competition. You can also find a lot of stock photo sites now that are um, definitive by subject. So, for instance, if you're doing food, um, you know, there's a food image stock photo site uh, that just deals with those issues. You know, and you can get away from the general wow. sites that sometimes don't have the, the greatest content. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really great point that there are ways that you can – legally and legitimately use content and um you just have to be aware i mean that that's why i wanted to have this conversation because these really are the things that people they just need to know they you know they just need to understand it and speaking of that you mentioned before about dmca and i want to circle back to it because i would imagine that most of my listeners don't know what that is so All right can you, you know, go a little deeper on that? Sure. Uh, so the DMCA is a federal law. It's actually the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. It was enacted in 1998. Uh, it applies throughout the United States. And as the name suggests, it deals with copyright online. Uh, in 1998, we had Congress and the president um, 
we're actually still speaking to each other. Um, <laughs> you know, the politics wasn't as bad as it is now. Uh, you had the internet had existed for a while, but it was really coming to its own as a commercial media. And, and there was a question about, um, you know, how do we keep this, this new platform growing without being just wiped out by lawsuits? Uh, and so a number of different laws were enacted um, to try to, to reach that goal. The DMCA was one. DMCA has its critics, um, but it's actually been a pretty effective law. Um, so copyright, because people can right-click, copy, and publish anything, copyright infringement is always going to be a problem on the web. And what the DMCA says, well, it says a number of different things, but what the key section is Section 512C, and we want to focus on. And what it basically says is that if you are an Internet-connected platform, meaning a website or an app, um, and you allow users to post content to your site or your app, you cannot be held liable for copyright infringement uh, on that content so long as you follow a particular compliance process. So let's talk about Facebook. Facebook has 1.4 billion users or whatever the number is these days. No way that Facebook could possibly monitor all their content and determine if users are posting you know, copyright protected content or not. It's just impossible. Um, right. And so under the DMCA, what happens is, let's say I go take a picture off the New York Times, I think it's funny, and I post it to my site without, there to my Facebook page without consent. New York Times sees that. They submit a complaint um, to Facebook through what's called their DMCA agent. And Facebook then files a compliance process. And that compliance process is basically, as long as my complaint meets the, um, the required factors, there's five factors when you submit it. But when I, when I do that and they see that it meets it, they will immediately take down the content. They'll, they'll then send me, the person who posted the content, a message saying, hey, we received a copyright infringement complaint uh, regarding this content. Um, you know, you have a right to do a counter notice or we can just drop it. In 95% of cases, that'll be the end of it. You know, the content's removed from the site. And it goes back to what we originally talked about. A lot of people repost things without thinking about copyright infringement or they may not even be aware of copyright at all. Um, and right. so that'll put the end to it. However, um, that person, let's say it's a news story and they say, no, you know, this is a valid use of the, of the content in question. They'll file a counter notice. And then at that point, that person who posted the content and the copyright owner can go to court, uh, to federal court and pursue a copyright infringement action and they can hack it out. Facebook, however, would not be dragged into that lawsuit. They have immunity. And so that's the big key. If you're a business and you allow users to post to your site, um, you know, you have the right um, to pursue immunity there. It doesn't matter. You don't have to be as big as Facebook. It applies from everybody, whether you're a large company or a tiny blogger who's just starting out. Uh, and considering that copyright infringement is the most common claim online, you know, complying with the DMCA is a really smart move <laughs> because you're getting immunity from the biggest, you know, most common claim that you're going to see online. Now, the DMCA, right. right, and importantly, the DMCA does not protect you when you're the party posting content. So if Zuckerberg on Facebook posted an image that he, he for some reason, stole from another site, Facebook would not be protected from that. Uh, because it's not user content. It's, you know, somebody at the company is ah. posting it. So it's a very important distinction. Um, but if any site, any of my clients that come in, if they allow comments on their blog posts, anything of that sort, uh, you know, anything where the user can upload it, go ahead and do, go DMCA compliant. It's cheap. Um, you have to register an agent with the copyright office. It costs $6. Um, so, you know, <laughs> the cost is just minimal. Uh, to get in compliance, and you have immunity for as long as the law is in place. Um, so wow. it's definitely it's definitely a smart move to, to take. Now, on the other side of that, let's say you post content online. You were talking about people are afraid to post content because it'll get stolen. Well, you have your content, yeah. and let's say we use Copyscape or somebody lets us know our content's been stolen. I can then look at that site that has the stolen content, and I can usually I'll send them a letter first saying, hey, you know, what the heck, take my content down. If that doesn't work, you can then contact their host. Uh, now, their host, the way you find the host is you do a who is search on their domain, and uh, the host, the server information will be listed there. Um, but if when you contact the host, the host is in the same uh, position as Facebook was, uh, in that they have, they're obviously hosting a bunch of these sites. They're passive, so they're not liable for copyright infringement so long as they comply with the DMCA process. And if they look at your complaint and they see it's valid, they will take down that page or take down that site, and they'll contact that individual. And they'll tell them, hey, you know, we received this complaint, and then it's up to that person to file a counter notice. Now, not, again, 95% of the cases, you're never going to get counter notice because it's obviously copyright infringement. Content goes down. 
that's the end of it. You didn't have to hire a lawyer. You didn't have to spend thousands of dollars. And that's the beauty of the DMCA. Now there are abuses on both sides of that, but um, you know, that's definitely, definitely the, the advantage of the law. Um, so the DMCA is something that if you're going to operate online, you know, you really want to familiar, uh, familiarize yourself with it. There used to be a book online. I think second edition is coming on, out now. It's on Amazon. It's called the DMCA handbook. Um, if you, you know, if you want to wow. get a solution that's in basic English, not legal English, uh, and isn't too expensive, I would definitely take a look at that book. Awesome. Wow. Who knew? Uh, well, I mean, you know, I guess you have to be a lawyer to know. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to take a quick sponsor break and then I have some more questions for you. Accelerate Great. Your Business Growth Podcast is happy to be sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken digital audio entertainment and information. They have over 150,000 titles to choose from and you can listen to them on any device including whatever you're hearing us on right now. If you sign up at our link, which is audibletrial.com slash business growth, you get one free audiobook and a one month trial of the service. Some examples of books you can listen to on audible.com are 8020 Sales and Marketing by Perry Marshall and The Go-Giver by Bob Berg. Both of them have been guests on this podcast. So visit audibletrial.com slash business growth, explore the books that are of interest to you and receive one free audiobook when you sign up for the trial. Today we're talking with Richard Chapo about legal developments that online businesses need to know. So um, I'd like to talk some about images because that really seems to be such a, a big deal. Um, if I am, uh, let's say I'm a photographer and I want to put my images out there, but I don't want people taking them and, you know, using them, um, how do I, I, I mean, I would think searching text is easier than searching images to see if other people are using them. Are, are there other sorts of safeguards that someone could use with their artwork, you know, or their, you know, their image library that they're putting out there? Oh, you know, I use programmers to <laughs> handle that side of it. There are ways to do it. You can put tags into the images. Um, you know, you can water mark them. There are different approaches. I don't get into the technical side too much, but yes, there are. Um, okay. I, I wouldn't know the technological solutions to that, but no, it is, it's absolutely, obviously a little bit different. Um, and if you are a photographer and you're going to put your content online, <laughs> it's, it's going to be stolen. Um, uh, you know, people, images are just the number one thing that people steal, uh, music being the yeah. second, second thing. Although with music, of course, obviously when you get into the peer to peer, um, sharing, you know, that's a bigger issue, but yes, no, you're definitely going to look, look at some technical solutions to that. The other thing that you can do, well, it depends what you're doing with your images. If you're going to sell your images through photo sites, uh, that will license them from you. You know, the good news is those sites will often take care of it for you. Um, so there's okay. that advantage. But if you're going to do it on your own, you're going to put your images up on your own site um, and what have you. Uh, yes, you, you really need to, to look into that. You also want to go ahead and actually copyright those images. And you want to do it within 90 days of the images being created because if you do, uh, under copyright law, you're going, to, you're going to get a lot of advantages and a lot of assumptions in your favor. You're also going to be able to claim what's called statutory damages, um, which means that if you were to sue somebody for copyright infringement, uh, you know, a judge or a jury will make that determination as to, you know, the value of each each um, violation, and again, it would be between two hundred and one hundred fifty thousand dollars. In reality, it'd probably be more in the uh, thousands. But um, yeah. that's important to do. If you don't do that registration, then you would have to prove economic loss, um, and so you can run into questions there. It's harder. It's more difficult to to get to that end. Um, there were two other things I wanted to mention about the DMCA real quick um, for yeah. listener for listeners who are already complying with the DMCA. Um, and have registered an agent with the Copyright Office. Um, the Copyright Office is a bit of a mess, a little story. So the DMCA came out and was enacted in 1998. The Copyright Office has required f paper DMCA registrations up until 2016. So even though it was an online law and everything else, they still required you to send in a piece of paper to register your agent. Uh, and they had one clerk who handled all the registrations. <laughs> 
And as you can imagine, it was a nightmare. She was great. I mean, she worked hard, but she was just, just crushed with work. Um, sure. So uh, joining the modern era, the Copyright Office uh, this past December launched an online DMCA agent registration system. Now, here's the important thing. For businesses who had previously registered an agent, uh, the important thing to understand is your previous registrations do not carry over to the new system. They're not moving oh. them to the new system. So you have to re-register again. And the deadline is uh, December 31st, 2017. So you have this whole year to do it. After that, um, if you're not registered, you're not in compliance with the DMCA and you lose your immunity. So go wow. re-register. Yeah, it's very, very important that you re-register. No kidding. Um, and an aspect of that also is that um, you, hearing the December date, you may think, eh, I'll do it, you know, November or whenever. Um, there's a new rule that says that when you register the agent and uh, your business has to be listed and the real physical address where the business is conducted also needs to be listed. This is a problem for people who are working from home, uh, have yeah. kids, you know, you don't want a quote unquote fan showing up on your doorstep. Um, you can't use a PO box anymore or anything of that sort. However, you can file a petition with the Copyright Office for the right to use a P.O. box. And if you go to the Copyright Office's site or at the end of the, the podcast, I'll uh, give you my website. You can just contact me and I'll give you the uh, page where all the information is. But you can file a petition. But the petition takes about a month. Uh, and you're, you're basically yeah. applying to uh, the lawyers at the Copyright Office to give you permission to use it. So obviously, we're getting towards the end of the year. We want to make sure that you know yeah. that you get that in in time. But the bigger important thing is if you're going to file uh, or if you previously filed a, and registered a DMC agent, you have to do it again. Uh, and if you need an agent, you can go to dmcagentservice.com. Uh, it's a great service. I know this because I own it. Uh, <laughs> but... <laughs> But the advantage of that is that you don't have to list your name, your phone number, and your email. So if you need those things. But the more important thing is, yeah, make sure you get your agent registration back in so you don't lose your immunity. Uh, as for wow. images, yes, it's yeah. weird technical uh, aspects of the copyright law. Uh, with images, images are, you know, something that it's, they're always difficult. Not only do you have the technical side of it, but, um, you know, as we talked about before, because we're a sharing society, um, you have to be kind of cognizant of, you know, do you really have permission or do you really not? So if you see things on Instagram, I mean, you're supposed to share them. That's the whole point of it. But does that sharing, right. you know, does it apply to, to everything? Does it apply to, um, you know, you can share it on your Instagram account or can you take it and use it, you know, on something else? And that gets into the questions where you have to kind of look at the terms of each site to get an idea of what's allowed and what's not allowed. So is there, do you think there's a difference between, sharing something and because you find it interesting and you think other people would find it interesting and and taking someone's image or content and without their permission i mean you know like and using it as your own i mean it that feels like a a really fine line to me it is it is and that's why the fair use defense is so frustrating yeah. <laughs> because yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, so my clients now that launch a course, people will buy the course, they'll copy every part of it, repost it on a site. And that's clearly copyright infringement and it's intentional. And, you know, but somebody else that may have purchased the course and says, wow, this is a great course. And they give their, you know, boyfriend or girlfriend access to the course. Hey, look at this, read this. We should do this. You know, they're clearly not doing it with a malicious intent. Yeah. Um, the problem is law has a, really difficult time differentiating between that. And the argument would be that you would apply the fair use defense, um, you know, to try to address that. And the other argument would be that if damages were awarded, you know, in the case where you're just showing it to your, your loved one, um, you know, the court would probably be more receptive to the idea that it's an innocent, you know, infringement. And so that damages awarded would be, you know, 200 bucks or something of that sort, something low. Yeah. And, yeah. but you know, that sounds great in a vacuum, but the problem is, you know, at that point, you spent thousands of dollars defending the case. Um, and so, so, you know, what's, what's a great solution there? Now, I will tell you, as somebody who represents content producers, you know, that if I saw that situation where somebody just shared it with a loved one or what have you, uh, the likelihood of me filing a copyright infringement lawsuit is very low. Um, yeah. be because, you know, what are we really achieving? Is this worth our time? Um, you know, those kinds of issues. Now, if I see you steal the course and you, you put it up on another site and you're selling it directly for less than my client is selling it, you know, 
you're in trouble because yeah. we're not yeah. going to stop. Um, right. <laughs> you know, you know, you made that decision and now you're going to reap the unfortunate benefits of it. So, you know, yeah. it, it is a kind of a distinction, a practical distinction. Um, okay. So this is going to sound like a really silly question, but I'm going to ask it anyway, <laughs> because the chances are good. Someone's sitting here thinking it and is going to want to know when, when you talk about people copywriting their content, it, do, are you saying they just go to the government website and register their content? I mean, yes. It, so, right? So, like a photographer, like every picture they take, they would have to then submit the, uh, an application or... Yes, yeah, so you go to the copyright office and they actually have excellent guides. It's $55 for most content. Um, but what you can do is you don't have to copyright every individual work. You can copyright a group of works. So, if you go out and you take, you know, 100 pictures of... Um, models at a particular, you know, fashion show or something of that sort, you can copyright all of those collectively. Um, so okay. you don't, have, you don't have to do it for each individual one. When you go to the copyright office website, you want to look at it's, they have it really well done and I don't like most of what they do, but they have it very well done in this sense. And they have, they're called circulars and, and they tell you, how do I copyright my work? Um, and you can look at it and it's, it's really, really simple. I'd love to tell you to use a lawyer, but <laughs> most people don't these days. I mean, you just don't really need to. Um, and the cost is, is so low. Now on your sites, you have to evaluate, um, you know, what, what is really worth protecting and what isn't. I mean, a general blog post, you know, do you want to spend the time and money? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, blog posts are a dime a dozen, yeah. even if you're writing the greatest blog post ever. Um, right. You know, probably not. And if people infringe on your post, you know, often you can contact them and say, hey, give me a link, you know, because the link is more valuable for SEO purposes than maybe going ahead, right. and, you know, going after them. And the other thing about copyright, and here's a, a little hint that most copyright attorneys don't talk about, um, it's also a way to get introduced to larger people or to influencers and what have you, people of significance. Um, because if you've written something that's amazing or you've, you've created, uh, you know, an amazing image or something and you know, you know, you can share that with those people. Or if you're really lucky, you know, they'll take it and republish it without thinking about copyright. And it gives you an, an ability to contact them and to build up, you know, following with different people. Um, so that when you have other things that you want to promote, um, or if they have a podcast or something, I've had this happen where, you know, I contacted somebody, they were, you know, infringing on actually a trademark for one of my clients and explained it all to them and they took it down and apologized. And then they invited me onto their podcast <laughs> as a guest nice. to talk about, you know, so that, so there are opportunities out there. It kind of goes back to what we were talking about with the band, you know, try and be a little practical and think about, you know, what do I yeah. want to do here? Because if you just, you know, default to the, you know, raging Viking mode, um, you know, sometimes you can miss, uh, you know, opportunities to, to turn something for the better. Um, but yeah, so be a little careful. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. Thank you. Thank you for that. So um, talk some about like terms and conditions, because you said something earlier that made me think of it. I'm trying to remember what it was that you said that, that um, w was like, there's a way to let people know when they come to your site what they can and can't do or what your expectation is of them. Is right. that true? Uh, it is. In terms of conditions are an interesting little phenomena. Um, so as I had mentioned with copyright law, copyright law is hundreds of, year, hundreds of years old. Many areas of law that apply to the internet are also hundreds of years old. So, for instance, contracts, um, and you know, the English barristers with the uh, Whigs and the whole deal have worked through a lot of these concepts. And once the U.S. was established, came here and we worked through these concepts. The question has been, how do they apply online? And in a lot of cases, not well. Um, so, with a contract, what you need to show often is an offer being made, that offer being accepted by the other party. And if you think about if you ever purchased a house or you purchased a car or whatever, you know, that happens. You sign the, the agreement to purchase that. Um, and that's the contract. Well, how do you do that online? How, how do you address those issues online? Because obviously we're not going to have a signature. And, you know, if anybody's ever used a web, you don't go around signing your name everywhere. 
Uh, and so terms and conditions are basically an effort to address those issues. In terms of conditions, they're also called terms of service, uh, terms of use. Um, they used to have individual you know, applications, but not really anymore. Uh, and so anyways, that's what you're trying to address in those. So what kind of issues come up? Um, any, everything from uh, reposting content. So let's, let's say that I have a form and you want to post an image to my form that you took of a Thanksgiving party. Okay, well, now technically you own the copyright to that image. I don't have permission to use that. So on my yeah. terms, terms and condition, I'll have a clause that says, uh, I have the right to repost this on the image. You're giving me a license to redo it. Um, so that can go on and post it on the form. So when it's up on the form and you forget about it, and three years later you find it there, you don't come back and sue me. Okay, and you, this is an area that's always contested. Instagram has written some horrible, <laughs> horrible clauses in this regard, and people think that think that the site is taking their content, and that's right. not what's that's not what's happening. They're really just trying to make sure that they're not going to get sued. You know, if somebody shows up two years later and says, "Why is this image up?" Um, there are other issues. If you're if you're running a business online, terms and conditions are your friend. They are your friend. Do not use generators. Do not steal them from other sites. Um, terms and conditions can really save you. People say, I want to go into business, but I don't want to be sued. Terms and conditions are how you limit those lawsuits. Um, so let me give you an example. The wonderful thing about the World Wide Web is that it's worldwide. The terrible thing from a legal prospect about the World Wide Web is it's worldwide. So let's say you're sitting in uh, Florida and you're selling you know, party hats online through your e-commerce site and somebody in Vancouver, um, you know, gets a hat, they're unhappy with it, dispute starts flying back and forth and they decide to sue you in Vancouver. Well, you know, how much could a party hat cost? Not much, but the cost of traveling to Vancouver and defending the case is going to be extensive. Um, so you can include a clause in your terms and conditions that says, if a dispute arises uh, between us, you know, any disputes will have to be heard here in Florida, you know, in the city that you live in. And most ah. courts, a majority of courts are going to uphold that. Not all, but a majority of courts will uphold that. And so each of the clauses that you're putting into your terms and conditions are designed to tilt that in your favor. Uh, in 2011, the Supreme Court, we have a, a conservative Supreme Court majority now, so they've been changing the law quite a bit. And they decided a case called AT&T Mobility versus Concepcion. And it was a, a case involving um, mobile phone service. And AT&T put a clause in there that said that if – um, the, these couple that had purchased the service had any issues uh, and wanted to sue at and They had to go to arbitration instead of trial. That's important because arbitration is usually much more business friendly um, than, than the court system um, because business, an arbitration is going to be heard by a retired judge or an attorney. And so they're less inflamed by emotional aspects of a case and they're more receptive to technical legal arguments. So as a business, you always want to go to arbitration. You, you, typically, you want to stay away from you know, uh, huh. trials before a jury. That's just a general rule. Uh, up until that time, up until 2011, you couldn't do that. The Supreme Court, when it had a liberal majority previously, it said, you know, this isn't a federal issue. It's for the states to decide. And nearly every state said you could not force consumers into arbitration uh, because it's not to their advantage. The big key to the decision was actually something that dealt with what are called uh, class action lawsuits. So think about the transitions, the transactions you do online. How many of them are for tens of thousands of dollars? Very, very few. Um, you know, most yeah. people are going, going to Amazon or wherever and they're spending maybe a couple hundred bucks. Okay. Well, in that situation, under in the legal um, jurisdictions in, in the country, in every state, a lawsuit for typically under $10,000 or $5,000, depending on the state, would go to small claims. Um, you can't even have a lawyer. It, it's, it's just considered such a small claim uh, that they're not going to give much substance to it. So in those situations, you're never going to be able to get a big law firm that has you know, tons of quality litigation attorneys to look at your case. So what the, what the law had said was, well, okay, but if you have a website that has, let's say they put out a product, they sell it to 100,000 people and the product is defective and 40,000 people get sick, those 40,000 people can file one lawsuit. And it's called a class action lawsuit. They can basically team together. And because the damage is then, because there are 40,000 of them instead of just one, are much bigger, you can get you know, higher quality lawyers involved and things of that sort. Uh, that Supreme Court decision in 2011, Conception, gives businesses not only the right to force consumers into arbitration, but to waive their class action lawsuit rights. Um, so your terms and conditions uh -huh. include a clause that says that they're waiving that class action right. Now, and that, once you have those two clauses in there, 
you know, 80, 85, 90% of lawsuits that would be filed against your online business are never going to happen. Yeah. You know, it just doesn't make economic sense. Uh, and while people will get fired up and outraged and want to sue you, lawyers don't. Um, because those lawyers who are bringing those lawsuits are typically doing them on a contingency basis, which means they don't get paid uh, unless they recover something. And whatever they recover, they only get 33% of. Well, wow. if, it's, if it's a transaction for $600 and they win yeah. and they get $200, you know, they're, gonna, they're not going to be much interested in that case. Now, if it was a class action lawsuit, you know, and they're going to get, you know, a million dollars out of it, well, you know, that's a whole different issue. Um, you know, people say, you know, justice should be blind, but let's be honest, there's an economic aspect to it. Yeah. Um, and so with your terms and conditions, you're really trying to create, a, you know, what I call field of battle, if you will, it's a bit dramatic, but where you have, you know, most of the advantages. Now, you can't make it completely one-sided um, because if you do that, then the court's just going to throw it out. They're going to call it an unconscionable contract. It's not fair. Um, if you think terms and conditions are something that aren't important, you know, and you have Apple products, just ask yourself, how many times do you log into iTunes or whatever and Apple makes you agree to their new terms? They're doing yeah. that for a reason. <laughs> you know, they're, they're not doing that to get clicks. They're doing it because, you know, they're all over that and they're trying to, uh, you know, address different legal issues they have. Now, they have many more legal issues because they have a lot of different, you know, devices and platforms and things of that sort. But that's what's going on there. The other thing that has come out in the law with terms and conditions that are important to understand is if you, um, so let's go back to 2000. At that time, most judges couldn't set up their own email uh, you know, much less figure out some of the complexities of the web. And so at that time they said, well, as long as you have the terms and conditions on the website or the app, you know, you're fine. And so on a lot of websites you go down and you would see a link in the bottom of the, you know, the footer that says terms and conditions. Well, right. you fast forward 15 years now and judges who use the internet all the time, just like you and I, they're normal people and they're growing up using it and they understand nobody goes down to that link and clicks it. Uh, and, and so they're not enforcing terms and conditions anymore unless you have something that's called a click box um, functionality. So if you go to some sites now and you'll sign up uh, for, you know, register for something or you'll purchase something and you'll see, they'll make you check a box saying, I agree to the terms and conditions and privacy policy. Okay. That's the check box yeah. agreement. You have to have that um, or they're not going to enforce your terms. So if you have a website where you, people need to register or they need to purchase something, uh, you know, where, where they have to take some kind of affirmative action, make them do that <laughs> and keep a log of it. Otherwise, the terms and conditions on your website are useless. There is an exception to that, which is if the, the person, the users of the website have constructive notice of the terms. However, the way that that is proved in court is you would need that person who is suing you to say, oh, yes, I scrolled down to the bottom of the site, I clicked that link, and I read it. Now, how many people, how many people do you think are going to say that? You know, not very many. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and then and when they say no, then you're left arguing to the court, well, a reasonable person would have done that, and the court's almost never going to agree with that. I mean, you might get a one-off judge, but um, the far better approach is just make them check the box. Now, here's the thing with the check-the-box agreement. Programmers understand this now, and so you can go out and you can find open source JavaScript or even WordPress plugins, I think, now. So this isn't a difficult thing. Um, just make sure that you do it, uh, and then you'll tighten up, you know, the legal defense for your site should a dispute arise. Wow. Okay. <laughs> now, <laughs> it's like, um, not to make it um, even crazier, uh, but... What about if you market to kids? Right. What are the things people need to know about in that regard? So if you're marketing in the United States um, to children online, you need to comply with a federal law called the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. And basically what it says is that before you collect personal information from kids under 13 online, uh, you need to get verified parental consent. Um, it's, it's a technical law that's pain to deal with. However, there is a great escape on this law. Um, the couple, or the uh, FTC is in charge of enforcing it, and the FTC created a safe harbor provisions. And so there are companies out there, 
uh, like Trusty, where you can go to them and you can sign up for their programs and they will put you into compliance. They'll give you a checklist of compliance factors that you go through, how to get consent, you know, these kinds of things, what needs to be in your privacy policy. Uh, and as long as you comply with those, you have immunity from prosecution for copy, uh, for COPA violations. Um, so if, if you're marketing to kids under that, it gets pretty technical these days. Um, go to these company, do, just do a search on Google for COPA, it's C-O-P-P-A, uh, Safe Harbor. And you'll see a bunch of companies listed there and advertising their, their services. But the important thing to understand is that you do have to get parental verification. Um, and there are different ways of doing that. You can get a credit card charge or you can you know, do um, video conferencing or have them call or have them send in, uh, you know, copy of their license and a statement that they can send. There are different ways. You want to talk to the safe harbor groups. Um, but definitely go with the safe harbor groups because even if you're found in violation, uh, as long as you're part of those safe harbor groups, the FTC doesn't come after you. They go after the safe harbor group um, for not, not keeping all their, uh, their clients you know, in compliance. So definitely do that. But under 13 is the key there. Now, if you're selling to Europe, um, things get a little uglier. Uh, Europe is enacting a new general data protection regulation, which is basically a big privacy regulation for all the EU countries. It goes into effect in May 2018. It sets that age at 16. So if you're selling to anybody under 16, um, you need to follow a provision similar to COPPA. Um, but each member state, and there are 28 of them, can set their own age from anywhere from under 16 to under 13. So it's basically one of the reasons people hate the law. Um, <laughs> so, so if you well, you can imagine the technical problem. So imagine your Facebook or, you know, you're a site where you don't have age data on your users. Okay, well, how are you going to determine right. who's 15 or who's 16 or, you know, so it's, it's yeah, no, it's a head scratcher. Um, and it's, you know, a problem. Unfortunately, the EU hasn't really issued any clarity on you know, how you're supposed to go about doing that. Um, the EU is a horrible organization. They really are. I mean, it's, uh, in the United States, when we pass a federal law, um, the federal law typically gives governance to an agency, so say the FTC the FTC will then read the law and see, okay, there are these vague issues and they will issue regulations explaining how they're going to interpret the issues. So as a lawyer in a business, you know, and you can comply. Um, ah. You may, may complain a lot about it, but you can comply. In the EU, they don't do that. The EU just issues these regulations that are incredibly vague. And then they say, well, you know, we'll, we'll try and you know clear up issues later. And it's like, really? Uh. <laughs> Yes. So, um, you know, regardless of the merits of the EU as an economic unity from a regulatory perspective, you know, Europe's yeah. a lovely, lovely place to visit, but you really wouldn't want to live there. And <laughs> it's just, it's, it's a nightmare. It is. I have some clients dealing with wow. it. It's, it's, you know, I used to have hair three months ago when we started working on it. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a problem. So, but anyways, if you're marketing kids, it's under 13 in the U.S. and under 16 in the EU if you're looking at the EU. So I would think, well, with the EU, I would think that if you just established a, a process for anyone under the age of 18, you'd be covered because then you just don't have to worry about it. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people are going to pick under 16 as kind of the default age. Um, yeah. there, are, there are groups out there that have, uh, you know, tried to put together technical solutions, um, but, you know, I don't know how, how well they work. It's a tough thing. Sort. Yeah, it because, is. you know... I, you don't know the, how old they are. Well, one of the bigger things you have happening on the internet now, and you know, for the people listening that are starting businesses or running businesses, who are looking at multinational operations, um, one of the key things to understand is that the World Wide Web is not going to be the World Wide Web for much longer. Uh, what you have are governments and economic unions are dividing up the internet, and they're doing it by creating laws that conflict with each other. That's very difficult to comply with as a business. So, for instance, Google, Facebook, and, uh, you know, all of these companies in the U.S., privacy law here as a general concept for consumers is, you know, honestly, it's a joke. We don't have much privacy. Yeah. Um, and so these huge business models are built on the concept of sweeping up as much as your, of your personal information as possible, monetizing it, and reselling it. That's the whole Google model. That's the whole Facebook model. That's, you know, all these, all these large companies. And hey, more power to them, not a problem. But the problem is the U.S. is what's called an opt-out country. 
Um, they can do that legally unless, you know, you contact them and tell them specifically not to do it, depending on the particular law you're trying to, you know, enforce through them. So, for instance, with kids. Um, many other regions of the, of the world are not opt-out countries. They're opt-in um, areas. So, the EU is opt-in, for instance. So, in the EU, the, this business model is just sweeping up personal information. doesn't work um, because you have to have consent first. And with the new data regulation that's going into effect in May, not only do you have to have consent, but we were talking about the check the box approach for terms and conditions. They're going to require that for consent. So when you go to an EU newspaper, let's say, um, the first thing you're going to see is a box pop up and say, hey, we are going to collect your information for these purposes, blah, 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 blah. Check the box if you agree or check the box if you, you, know, you don't want us to collect. And it's, you know, it's, wow. yeah, it's just an ugly mess. Not to mention that when you go to these websites, it's going to look terrible. Um, but on top of that, you know, then you have China and Asia, they're all doing something different in Asia. You know, trolls are a huge problem in the U S with, you know, people have anonymity and they say stuff they wouldn't say to their mother. Um, China just outlawed anonymity. So if you're posting to a Chinese website or company or something of that sort, you have to use your real name. There are no longer, you can no longer use, um, you know, fake names and what have you. So they're getting rid of anonymity wow. in Russia. Russia has said that if you don't, uh, if you collect information from our citizens, you have to store that information on servers located in Russia and you can play the ominous music now, um, you know, as to, <laughs> as to what they'd want to do with that. Um, and most American companies didn't comply. Now, LinkedIn did not comply. Uh, and so for a long time, you couldn't see LinkedIn in Russia. If you tried to pull up the site, it was blocked. Wow. Uh, now it may be back up because Microsoft purchased it, but, um, it, right. you know, but that's what you're going to see. You're going to see a lot of division. So as a business owner, you need to think about, well, how am I going to address my market? What is my target market now? What is my target market going to be? Uh, and how does jurisdiction play into that? Now, most companies uh, that are in the U S or that market to the U S will just typically market to the U S and they don't really care about other regions. Um, but look at your sales and try to figure out, you know, if that's still going to be the case it, with some of these larger companies like Google, for instance, Google started launching companies in individual countries in the EU to try to comply with the EU. And so you have Alphabet and Google, but you also have a Google Spain that was just applicable to, you know, doing business in Spain. And they tried that approach and they had problems with that approach um, <laughs> uh, because the EU said, no, you know, Google Spain and, and normal old Google, you're basically the same country, company. So we're going to find you, you know, find you liable for antitrust. And they find them, I don't know what the number was, $2.7 billion here a couple months ago. Um, you know, Facebook, Apple, you know, tried to move all of their operations to Ireland so they would get a better tax rate. Right. And now the EU is demanding that, you know, Ireland and Apple repay $10 billion in taxes or some, you know, obnoxious amount of money. Um, so you're seeing a lot of this develop and it's going to continue to go that way, unfortunately. Um, so as a business owner, you know, you need to think about what are my markets, you know, and, and how do I plan for the potential isolation of those markets? Right. Ugh, there goes globalization. Yeah, yes. Well, you know, the irony is privacy is kind of the area where it's really, you're seeing a lot of the initial uh, walls being put up, so. Well, I think a lot of people feel like um, it's been a bit of a runaway train, and, and when you have all of these breaches and hacking and all of that stuff, then people feel like they want, that they're willing to do things to have their privacy protected. No, but absolutely. It feels to me like the genie's out of the bottle. I, you know, I don't know how you. Well, you know, hacking is always going to exist. Um, yeah. You know, because these the hacks are sometimes it's you know an idiot employee, sometimes it's just a, a you know a common mistake. But a lot of times you're dealing with zero days, and zero days are errors in security or you know an overall site's um, platform. Um, you know, that the, the site and those groups don't know about and would probably never know about until they're pierced. Um, and so a lot of the larger companies have started um, programs where they pay hackers to alert them to problems, uh, yeah. you know, and, and pay them substantial amounts of money. And I think you're going to see more of that. But even, even the most strict um, requirements, you know, on privacy and on data breach notification in the EU, you know, so in the EU, if you have a data breach, um, you have to, give a notice within 72 hours. 
And actually some states in the U.S. have the same requirements. So Equifax waiting four months, um, you know, couldn't happen over there. Or Yahoo waiting, you know, what, five years to let everybody know their entire email system was hacked. Um, you know, wouldn't happen. Uh, well, it would be illegal, but it still wouldn't stop, you know, those hacks from happening. So then, yeah, the question boils down to how comfortable are you putting information online? And, you know, for old farts like myself, I'm not very comfortable doing that. Um, but people who have grown up in the Instagram and Facebook era, you know, sharing their content is secondhand. Right. I mean, that's that's the nature of things. It's how they do that. And it's going to be interesting as we move forward um, to think about, you know, all that content that's out there. So, you know, the content you posted doing something stupid when you were 13. Well, yeah. you know, when you're applying for a job when you're 27 and somebody's doing a background search and they find all these images, you know, how's that going to go down? <laughs> so, uh, I know, though. I have to say that I think that's sort of ridiculous because when I was, you know, if, if there had been the Internet when I was younger, we, all young people do stupid things. It's part of being young. Right, they just but, have the ability to broadcast it now, which we didn't before. I'm not sure it's really fair to penalize these people for things they did when they were young. Right. Well, I mean, when I, when I was growing up, I spent every day in the library. Um, but uh, yes, you <laughs> wait a minute. What? <laughs> <laughs> Read every book. Uh, you're seeing this. So, for instance, in the EU, they have what's called the right to be forgotten, which is exactly what you're talking about. So people can come in and say, "Hey, you know, I, you know, I want these images taken off Google search when somebody searches for my name and." You know, the, the first result is me at a you know fraternity party, you know, chugging a bottle of vodka upside down. Um, you know, uh, I want that image taken down. In the EU, they have that right. Citizens have that right wow. because privacy, privacy is considered a fundamental human right. But in the U.S., it's not considered a fundamental human wow. right because we have that little old problem of abortion. Um, there is no privacy right written into the U.S. Constitution. If you read the U.S. Constitution, you're going to find the, privacy, the word privacy anywhere. And so it has to be a court created right. Um, and, you know, for 50 years, we've argued over abortion, which is essentially a privacy right. Um, yeah. you know, and so, you know, whatever side you come down on that issue, it's obviously a controversial issue. And frankly, the decisions tend to change based on, you know, the majority um, situation right. on the Supreme Court. So, <laughs> so it's, yeah. a, it's a poor way of dealing with it. And this is kind of what I was talking about originally with we have this whole areas of law that are much older than the Internet and that don't translate well to the web. Um, Definitely. And, and so that's the problem you run to. Now, some states have privacy. California, where I am, we have a privacy right written into the California Constitution. And so California is always doing battle with the Supreme Court, um, you know, over how that works. Because generally, oh. yeah, generally federal law will trump state law, but not, you know, but it, it, only if it's, you know, on the same subject. Well, what's the same subject and how close can we get to that line? And, you know, so it's kind of this never ending uh, medium. Yeah, yeah, I don't see that, you know, stopping anytime soon, you know, people coming to a consensus. No, no. <laughs> you know, it's, no, it's, that one's going to go this on. this country for, anyway. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, and that's the unfortunate thing about the current political situation is we seem to have this odd thing where, you know, 45% of the country, 47% of the country is believes one thing and 47% believe not, you know, the other thing and the yeah. five people and 5% in the middle, you know sway the boat one way or the other it's very odd it is very odd i know we live in strange times indeed well my god well i have to say that i i found this fascinating i'm so glad that you um have spent some time with us on this because this really is important and it's a lot of information to know or you know to find out and to make sure that we're covered depending regardless of which side of these things, because I think a lot of us end up on both sides of it. Like I put content out on the internet and sometimes I want to share a picture of someone else. So I think, you know, most of us who are engaging are experiencing um, both sides of this. So will you share with my listeners how they can find you and your website and sure. anything you want to know? Sure. I think, I think the one thing with this and uh, legal podcasts, regardless of the area, always can be a little uh, intimidating and, and cause people to you know, lock up. Uh, I think the important thing to understand with these issues is they're just part of a to-do list that you need to deal with with your business. Uh, as an attorney, I hate accounting, but I do my books. You know, it's just something I have yeah. to do. Um, you should view these subjects in that same light. 
Um, so as a business owner, you know, either you can try to figure them out yourself. Don't think that's a great approach, but you can do a search for an internet lawyer in your area and just go sit down with them for an hour. They'll probably do it for free, to be honest, as an initial consultation. If not, it might cost you a couple hundred bucks, but just show them your sites and show them what you're doing and saying, you know, are there any red flags here? You know, what do I need and why? Um, you know, and, and get kind of an understanding if there's anything out there, you know, that you're, uh, you know, a landmine you're about to step on or what have you. And then, right. you know, if there are things that you need, prioritize them and then set out a budget and just work through them, you know, as necessary. Um, so don't, don't, my hope is listeners don't, you know, ah, you know, <laughs> freak out over, <laughs> you know, these things that are being said, but it's important to know what's out there. And as long as you, yeah. here's the other thing to understand, if you address the issues that apply to your site, I can guarantee you that, you know, 70% of your competitors have not. So if an attorney's out there trolling for lawsuits and they look at your site and they see that you're in compliance or mostly in compliance with all the issues you should address, and then they look at your competitor who hasn't done anything, who do you think they're going to pursue? They're going to pursue that competitor. Um, so, so don't look at all of this as, you know, hair on fire, we're all going to die. Um, yeah. You know, just, just, kind of address it, you know, as you would with other parts of your business that maybe aren't the most exciting aspects of it. Uh, as far as finding me, you can find me at my uh, law firm website, which is SoCal, like Southern California, SoCalInternetLawyer.com. Uh, and if you mentioned uh, the show, I'll be happy to give you a, a free website review. Um, you know, at least take a look at your stuff and let you know if there's any big issues. And if you need a DMC agent, you can get me at DMCAAgentService.com, highly creative business name. Um, and I'd be happy to talk with you there. Wow, that's great. And thanks for that offer for my listeners. That's, that's really very nice of you. And um, I, So I appreciate it. And I appreciate all the information that you shared. So thanks for being with us. Absolutely. My pleasure. Groovy. And I want to thank our listeners. I always like to thank the listeners because you folks are why we're doing this thing. And of course, our sponsor. Uh, get your free trial and a free audiobook by going to audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth. Continue to prosper and be curious. And until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. Hey friends, this is Jim Knight, former 21-year Hard Rock executive turned best-selling author and top 10 keynote speaker. And I'm Brant Menzwar, former frontman of Hollywood's most dangerous band turned top 10 motivational speaker and best-selling author. We host the how-to podcast, Thoughts That Rock, where we talk to rock stars, athletes, CEOs, astronauts, and even next door neighbors who share their expertise and opinions. Together, we tackle the most interesting and challenging topics of today. Whether you wanna learn how to become more confident, how to deal with anxiety at work, or how to write a hit song, or use Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in life. We've got hundreds of episodes to help amp up your life and move you forward. Subscribe to Thoughts That Rock wherever you listen to podcasts and check out evergreenpodcast.com for more information.